If you are worried you have Lyme disease, or just like the outdoors, and want the peace of mind of knowing whether you have Lyme disease or not, there is a new Lyme screening test based on decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at VCU Medical Center. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X.com. Or email at info at glymedx.com. Infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody. Robert here, and I appreciate you listening once again. And um, today's episode will be the first in a series of podcasts I like to call Parasites 101. And we're going to try to do this on a weekly basis. Uh, today we'll start with a look at Ascaris lumbricoides. Now, Ascaris lumbricoides is also known as the giant intestinal roundworm, and it causes an intestinal infection called Ascariasis. And it's part of the family of parasites known as the soil transmitted helminths. Well, joining me now is Rosemary Drisdell. Rosemary is the author of the book Parasites. Tales of Humanity's Most Unwelcome Guest. She also teaches clinical parasitology and writes about parasites from Nova Scotia, Canada. Hi, Rosemary, and welcome to the podcast. Hi there. Um, Thank you for having me. You're more than welcome. I appreciate you doing this. Um, and before we get into the specifics, uh, let's start with a general overview of this intestinal roundworm. Well, Ascaris lumbicoides is one of the most common intestinal worms in the world. It is a sort of uniquely human parasite. There are between 800 million to over a billion people currently infected with the worm, so that could be close to one in seven people. But that doesn't mean that every seventh person walking down the sidewalk beside you has these intestinal roundworms because they are fairly concentrated in the less developed countries and the tropical or subtropical areas of the world. Estimates for the United States, well, we're not really sure because they don't keep close track of it. In 1987, around 20 years ago, it was thought there were perhaps 200,000 people in the United States that were infected with Ascaris, but there could be more now, there could be less. Sanitation makes a big difference in the number of people. Yeah, and... Um who are the people at the most risk for this infection? Because you kind of talked about geography and the large numbers. Yeah, that's right. People living wherever there's poor sanitation would be most at risk. It is a parasite that is potentially capable of infecting people pretty much anywhere in the world. But, of course, those areas with poor sanitation are generally in the warmer parts, like I said, in the tropical or subtropical parts of the world. And children are probably the most commonly infected, and that's simply because they're more likely to be putting their dirty hands, their fingers, or toys, or other objects in their mouths, and therefore swallowing the eggs of the worm. Now, how does somebody contract this parasite? It's a soil-transmitted helminth, as you mentioned. So it is by eating the eggs that are found in the soil. So the soil has to be contaminated with human feces. People who are infected will pass the eggs in their stool. And if somebody then comes along perhaps two weeks to 18 days later and accidentally ingests those eggs, then they can end up with the worm living in the intestine. And uh, can you describe the life cycle of Ascaris? Sure. If we start with the ingestion of that egg, so you swallow the egg and it ends up in your small intestine and that's where it hatches. A larva emerges from the egg and it immediately starts to do a tissue migration phase. So it penetrates the lining of the intestine. It travels by the bloodstream to your liver and then to your lungs. This is a tiny, tiny microscope. It will break out through the lining of the lungs and eventually get coughed up and swallowed, so back into the stomach again, and if that larva is mature enough, then when it reaches the small intestine, it's capable of 
maturing into an adult worm. There are both males and females. The whole thing takes a couple of months before we have mature adults who are capable of producing these eggs then that are passed in the stool. So in order to have infective eggs passed in the stool, you need both male and female worms present in the intestine. Now, as the nickname says, uh, the giant intestinal roundworm, it's, it's a pretty big parasite. Um, can you discuss for the audience the size and the appearance of the adult Ascaris? Sure. These worms can be impressively large. The books have the females uh, topping out at about one and a half feet, although I personally haven't seen one that big. They're usually closer to maybe 10 inches to a foot in length when we see them in the lab. Males are a little smaller, which is typical of the nematode parasites. And they can be up to a foot, but again, usually when we see them, usually a little smaller, maybe six to eight inches. And, and it kind of looks like an earthworm, it actually. It looks very like a large earthworm. They don't have the same sort of movement as an earthworm. If you've ever seen an earthworm crawling around, it tends to have a sort of directional movement. It's going from A to B, whereas the Ascaris worms, they don't. They just kind of wriggle and writhe. They don't seem to really have a directional type of, of movement when they're at least outside the human body. Gotcha. It is pretty easy to tell an adult Ascaris from an earthworm, and sometimes there is a question, you know, if people find a worm perhaps on the floor or in the toilet and they're not quite sure where it came from, so it's important to be able to tell the difference. And the adult Ascaris tend to be smoother, they don't have that kind of segmented look to them, and interestingly, most people probably don't know this, but earthworms have little tufts of hair on them, which Ascaris don't. Well, I learned something today. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, let, let, let's get a word from our sponsor. Uh, for many years, we have been waiting for a Lyme disease test that actually works. After decades of research by Dr. Richard Marconi, a professor at the Medical Center at Virginia Commonwealth University, a breakthrough test has been developed. The GLD test, recently launched by Global Lyme Diagnostics, is based on Dr. Marconi's science. For more information, visit glymedx.com. That's G-L-Y-M-E-D-X dot com or email them at info at G-L-Y-M-E-D-X dot com. All right, Rosemary, um, how does somebody diagnose this parasite in a human infection? Well, these worms are pretty famous for wandering around. And so sometimes it's pretty obvious the patient may pass a large worm it might wriggle its way out while you're in the bath, or it might come out your mouth or your nose. Sometimes people find them on their pillows in the morning when they wake up. And when the worm appears like that, it's pretty easy. It's a pretty easy diagnosis because very, very few other things would look like that with that kind of a story behind them. But we also, as I mentioned, we can identify them in the lab, the adult worms, by putting them under a dissecting microscope and looking for smaller features. And we also often discover an Ascaris infection by looking at a stool specimen that's been submitted to the lab for ova and parasites. These worms produce a lot of eggs. For instance, the female can produce and, and release about 200,000 eggs a day. So it's usually pretty easy to find an egg in a stool specimen if they are there. Now, Ascaris is treatable, I take it. Yes, it is. There are several drugs that will work for Ascaris. I think albendazole is probably the one that's being most commonly used, at least in developed countries right now. Quite easy to uh, treat an Ascaris infection. Yeah. I, I remember uh, when I was studying parasol parasitology many years ago, um, the professor was talking about the treatment of Ascaris during certain times, and there would be a condition called erratic Ascariasis. Are you familiar with that? I'm not sure what exactly your professor would have been talking about, but there are a couple of un unfortunate things that Ascaris can do. As I mentioned, they sometimes come out the nose or the mouth, so they have, the females in particular seem to have a predilection for wandering around a little bit, mm -hmm. and sometimes they'll go up the common bile duct into the liver, into the pancreas, or or even break through the intestinal lining into the abdominal cavity. So these would certainly be unusual 
cases of ascariasis. Perhaps that's what he was referring to. Yeah, I, I, th I think it's the parasite was trying to flee from the drugs or, or something to that effect. Yeah, apparently certain drugs, not necessarily the parasitic drugs, but other drugs that where patients may be being treated for something else, will caught will stir up the worms and cause them to go wandering. Gotcha. But the explanation for the wandering that I've read that makes the most sense to me is that when you have an infection and there are only females present, they may be looking for a male. If you see the, the males when they come into the lab, their tail is curled up, sort of coiled around, and the female worm apparently sort of slides into that little coil. So this may be why she likes to go up tubes like the common bile duct or that sort of thing. I see. Now, with such a massive worm burden uh, worldwide, uh, what are global health authorities doing in the area of prevention and control of this parasite? This is one of the ones that's called a neglected tropical disease. And that is because where it is mostly present in the, in the tropical areas of the world, there hasn't tended to be a great deal of attention devoted to it. However, in recent years, there is more attention, and there are a number of programs. The World Health Organization is certainly pushing for the mass drug programs, where they target children and women of childbearing age, and they will give everybody in a community a drug, perhaps albendazole or mabendazole. These drugs are often donated. So they'll go in once or twice a year and just treat everybody, assuming that most people are infected. In some places, 70 or 80 percent of children will be infected with Ascaris. So, and whether they go in once or twice is often determined by what the prevalence of the infection in the community is. So if it's lower, maybe once a year. If it's higher, twice a year. Trying to simply cut down on the, the number of people that are infected and thereby try and break the life cycle of the parasite a little bit. One of the things that makes it very difficult to treat Ascaris is that the eggs of the worm are extremely resistant to harsh conditions including chemicals and they can live for a long time in the soil perhaps as long as 10 years or even longer so even if you were capable of wiping out the infection for everybody in a community it's going to come back because people are going to be exposed to those eggs that remain viable in the environment um, Rosemary, um, I didn't ask you about the pathology in humans. What can you tell us about um, the disease process in a human being? For many people who only perhaps swallow a few eggs, there won't be any symptoms whatsoever. They may never know they have this parasite. So it's people who actually swallow a lot of eggs or are continually exposed to the eggs where we see the problems. If you swallow a lot of eggs at once, then those larvae, as they're migrating through your tissues and especially through your lungs, can cause a, a pneumonia-type syndrome, which actually can do a lot of damage to the lungs and is sometimes fatal, but that would be an unusual case. In children and in adults, but mostly in children, when you have a large number of worms in the intestine, they can have a bloated appearance and they can get intestinal obstruction from the worms kind of tying themselves in knots. Damage due to migration of worms, as we've already mentioned, occurs sometimes. And in children as well, over the long term with chronic infection, there's a more insidious uh, set of symptoms where they simply don't grow as fast. They may grow up to be smaller than they ordinarily would. Their physical fitness may be poor and also they have poor performance in school. Now, you are the author of a book about human parasites. You're a lifelong student and teacher of parasitology. Do you have any interesting historical or personal stories concerning this parasite? Well, I have two little things. One, which I think is really neat, is that they think that that when humans domesticated pigs, this was sort of the beginning of where the incidence of Ascaris increased, and it could be that we caught it from the pigs, but it could also be that we already had it and gave it to the pigs. <laughs> and today, 
this is evolution as we're watching it happen. The pig parasite and the human parasite are very, very similar. They're morphologically indistinguishable from each other in the lab. And it seems quite obvious that people sometimes get the pig one and pigs sometimes get the human one. So we're not really sure which way it went. So I think that's fascinating and I'd love to, yeah. to try and figure out which way, which way that went originally so long ago. But the other thing that's more interesting in most recent years is you probably remember that they found King Richard III of England in 2012. He was buried under a parking lot in Leicester, England. And an analysis of the soil in his pelvic area turned up Asker's eggs. Not viable after all, the, all these years, of course, but recognizable as Asker's eggs. Which sort of levels the playing field, doesn't it? Even, mm -hmm. even royalty back in those days had these intestinal parasites because, of course, there was very poor sanitation. So pretty much everybody, even in England, even in the northern countries, pretty much everyone had Asker's. Yeah, I got a little short, uh, story to share myself. It's actually a personal story. In the mid-80s, I was living in the Philippines, and I was working in the microbiology lab there, and I was fresh out of school. And I remember they brought in this patient who had a lot of bleeding issues, and I had to go up and draw her blood one time. I was, I'm was i giving away my age here. I, <laughs> I was about 22 at the time. Uh -huh. And uh, I remember going up there to draw her blood, and a worm came out of her nose. Oh, yeah. And, and here I am, 22 years old. That just totally freaked me out. <laughs> but the unfortunate uh, end to this story was she went through so many units of blood trying, you know, trying to solve the problem. And she had this massive bolus of Ascaris mm. uh, worms in her intestine. And the, I was at the Air Force Base there. And as, you know, uh, as a act of diplomacy, they would occasionally take local nationals in to treat them in hard cases. Mm -hmm. And they stabilized her and she left the base and a day or so later she did pass away. Uh. So they didn't, they didn't totally solve it. But yeah, so just to... Uh, you know, not every 22-year-old goes through that. <laughs> yeah, no, it is obviously very disconcerting for the patient as well as anyone else oh, who's course. around if if a worm decides to emerge from a spot like that. I've heard of the very tiny, the very young, immature worms even crawling up the lacrimal duct and so coming out through the corner of the eye, which would be oh, wow. pretty disconcerting as well. Yeah. yeah. All right, Rosemary, let me uh, close with this. Do you have any final thoughts on Ascaris? Anything you'd like to share? Well, just that we're not gonna we're not gonna get rid of Ascaris anytime soon because, as I mentioned, it's so resistant in the environment and it's so hard to um, help people who live in those places where it's common because it's connected with poverty. And so, not only do you have to try and raise their standard of living, but you also can't clean up the environment. So, Ascaris is is going to be with us for a while. Okay. All right. Well, I want to thank you, Rosemary, for your time and expertise, and I'll see you again very soon. Oh, thank you very much for your interest.